Hello everyone. This is a lecture on competition for general ecology. Last time we focused, and, and actually last time has been a while, we focused on a type of ecological interaction between individuals in which one benefits and the other is harmed. Of course, that's predator-prey interactions. Today, we're going to explore another type of interaction. In this case, competition which is a negative interaction between individuals for the same limiting resource to survive, grow, and reproduce. It can occur between the same or different species. Um, when it's between individuals of the same species, we call it intraspecific competition. When it's between individuals of different species, we call it interspecific competition. Competition is one of the ecological mechanisms that uh, can fundamentally help determine where a species can live in nature and how abundant it is. It occurs in virtually every species to some extent and therefore plays an important role or plays, excuse me, an important role in governing the distribution and even diversity of species. For this lecture, the learning objectives are to explain how competition occurs when individuals experience limiting resources describe how the outcome of competition can be altered by a number of different factors, explain how competition over time can actually result in evolutionary changes in a species, and uh, distinguish between exploitation competition, interference competition, and apparent competition. I'm gonna focus on, um, I, I'm not gonna really uh, go into detail about exploitation and interference competition. Those you can read about in the book. I think that's pretty straightforward, but I will provide an example of apparent competition. Since the mechanism of competition f uh, is sort of fundamentally based on the availability of resources, we ought to talk about um, what a resource actually is. A resource is anything that an organism consumes or uses that results in an increase in um, the growth rate of its population. When it becomes more available, the resource um, populations grow. When um, it decreases, the growth rate of the population declines as the resource becomes less availability, uh, available. This cloud diagram highlights in kind of a fun way some different types of resources that can be important for individual organisms. Nitrogen, of course, water, light, um, but even things like mates, um, nest sites, and so forth. Uh, space is, is a resource. Um, uh, for example, a nest site is, once it's occupied, uh, it can't be used by another species or an individual of another species. Not all resources, however, limit populations, only those that are reduced by individuals in a population such that the reduction in that resource limits the growth of the population. An example of a resource that's not limiting to the growth of populations is oxygen. Although or all organisms consume oxygen, they don't reduce its concentration in the atmosphere to a level where it would limit population growth. But plenty of other resources can be reduced to a point where it will limit um, population growth. For example, um, nectar produced by flowers is an important food resource for birds that can become depleted, uh, particularly at some times of year, and thus can limit population growth among uh, populations of insectivorous birds. So resources um, are varied. They, of course, um, individuals of populations don't simply need one resource. They need many resources. And we'll talk about how um, resources can um, play a role in influencing population growth vis-a-vis -vis their limitation. And of course, as individuals are competing, in other words, um, attempting to acquire those resources, they deplete them. And as those resources become depleted, they will um, have a negative feedback, not only on the individuals of the species that are consuming them, but of other individuals of other species as well that require similar resources. <laughs> 
So resources can be either renewable, um, and most resources fall under that category, or non-renewable. That is, renewable resources can be regenerated. Things like light that continuously bathes planet Earth is continuously regenerated or supplied for individuals that require light, obviously like plants do, or phytoplankton. Seeds that are produced by plants, the seeds being a food resource for individuals of various different species that require seeds as a resource, those are regenerated by plants. Leaves, for example, that might be um, a resource for an herbivore or maybe a decomposer, etc. These are all resources that are continuously renewed or regenerated. They can be generated internally um, to, an, uh, to a system like seeds or leaves or so forth, or they can arrive external to the, the system. For example, light that is, um, comes from the sun or water that might um, you know, fall as rainfall. Okay, or be delivered through a river or flooding, for example, that might um, uh, be brought in from somewhere else. Non-renewable resources like space uh, are those that once they are taken, they're no longer available. And I mentioned like nest sites, for example, or um, sites for burrowing or what have you that once they're used, they're not available again for use by another individual. So theoretically, um, thinking about resources, if we, if we were to know the minimum amount of a resource, for example, that's required for a population of a particular species to grow, uh, then we should be able to predict which species is the best competitor for that resource. That is, which species will outcompete the other for any particular resource. An experiment to test this idea was conducted on two species of diatoms, and diatoms are just simply a group of, of microalgae. Uh, you might be aware of that. And these diatoms require silicate um, as an essential component of their cell walls. This study uh, here shows how a reduction in the availability of silicate can affect the outcome of competition between um, different species. So the two species here, and this is an example out of your, your book as well, uh, is just simply showing for two different species of diatoms, Asterionella and Cynedra, uh, the growth of their populations, um, the Asterionella is on the top, and it, the growth of its population is shown in red uh, over time, and for Cynedra uh, in purple below over time. As the populations grow in this um, system, and this was under controlled conditions, they were provided with nutrients that were required for their growth, including silica. But the silica concentration was monitored over their, um, their growth. And what you can see is that as they continue to grow, they reduced the concentration of silica in the medium in which they were growing. And so this is a, a very characteristic kind of response of a, new, of a resource to the growth of a population as, as the population grows and more and more individuals are utilizing those resources, the resources become depleted and eventually in limiting supply. When these two species, well, the, the panels on the left are when these two species are grown alone. When the species are grown together, uh, what you can see is that Cynedra continues to persist over time, but the other species, Asterionella, initially grows, but then declines. You can also see the decline in the silica concentration as those species uh, are growing. So 
what's happening here is that Synedra actually is able to reduce the silica concentration to a lower um, concentration than the minimum for Asterionella. And that's shown in the left two panels. Asterionella draws down the concentration of silica to about one micromolar concentration, and it can do fine under those conditions. But if the concentration of silica falls anywhere below that, uh, then uh, it's not um, sufficient for its growth. Synedra, however, can draw down silica concentrations below one micromolar, in fact, to about 0.4 micromolar, as shown in the lower left panel. And for that reason, it uh, is actually a better competitor than Asterionella for silica. And again, when I say a better competitor, I simply mean that it will outcompete the other species, in this case Asterionella, for this particular nutrient. So this study shows how a reduction of the availability of, of silicate can affect the outcome of competition between uh, the species. In nature, when two species compete for a single limiting resource, the species that persists, as is indicated here, is the one that has the ability to reduce the availability of the resource to the lowest level. So population growth is uh, generally limited by the resource by a resource that becomes limiting in its supply. So this sort of raises a fundamental question. Um, and we'll kind of explore this a little bit, and that is, can species in competition coexist? In the last slide, uh, you noted that um, Asterion Asterionella was outcompeted because um, Synedra drew down a resource below the level that um, Asterionella uh, could survive at. So um, this suggests that the best competitor will usually win, and um, but of course, ecological systems have an enormous number of species. So if species are in constant competition, and there's and if the best competitor always wins, how do we maintain species coexistence? And so this was a very um, sort of fundamental question that ecologists had very early on, and. Um, Gauss uh, studied this very early um, in sort of the history of ecological studies. You can see the study that is um, I'll be talking about here was conducted in or published in 1934. So this was quite some time ago. Um, but Gauss wanted to know um, how, under what conditions can, you know, does do species, um, is it possible that they can coexist under certain conditions, or does one species always outcompete the other? To, to look at this, um, Gauss grew two different species, in this case, um, two different species of paramecium that are very, very similar in their resource requirements. He grew them separately um, under um, certain growth conditions, and then together to determine uh, which was the better competitor. When he grew them separately under the uh, growth conditions that he did, they both in, um, uh, demonstrated what is approximately a logistic kind of growth curve. We can see an increase in abundance initially and then um, a damping off of growth and eventually a plateau that suggests some kind of carrying capacity for the particular conditions. But when he grew them together, he found that um, Paramecium aurelia uh, consistently outcompeted uh, Paramecium caudatium. Other studies examining species with similar resource requirements and put in competition for limited resources supported these results. And that was demonstrated, of course, in the previous slide as well, suggesting that um, in a consistent way, the best competitor should always win. 
this principle uh, that no two species should be able to coexist on the same re limiting resource, which, which fundamentally is, is what these studies were demonstrating, um, should suggest that two species with identical resource requirements should not be able to coexist indefinitely, and that one species, the better competitor, uh, will always outcompete and exclude the other. This principle has been referred to as the competitive exclusion principles. And again, um, it states that two species with identical resource requirements will be in direct composition, competition uh, because they're competing for the exact same resource and the better competitor will ultimately outcompete the other and cause it to go extinct. So again, this, this suggests a, a question, how, why can we have so many different species coexisting? We see the evidence of it all around, all around us, um, and ecologists did as well at the time. And so it really um, was kind of a boggling, a mind-boggling question for ecologists for a very long time. In fact, this, this uh, sort of question that ecologists had actually took on the name of the paradox of diversity. So in other words, all of this diversity that ecologists were um, could observe all around them was, was a paradox in the face of this notion of competitive exclusion. So it, the paradox of, of diversity kind of goes like this. Let's, let's just look at an example. Uh, we know that all plants require water and essential nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus and so forth, and, and they are competing for these, where they're competing for mostly the same limiting resources, right? Light, nitrogen, water, phosphorus, and so forth. The same could be said for insect-eating birds occupying the same forest canopy, large mammalian herbivores um, feeding in grasslands, predatory fish in a coral reef or plankton living in the oceans. They're all kind of competing for very similar resources. So how is it that these species, which largely compete for the same resources, don't competitively exclude one another? How can they coexist in the face of competition? So what we'll, what we'll look at are some examples of mechanisms that allow the persistence and coexistence of species, and we'll find that um, uh, species ha have been in competition for very long periods of time, and we'll see that um, species have evolved differences in a range of uh, ways that they use resources, external factors that modify the balance of competition have also played out in ways that uh, result in coexistence. So let's look at um, some of these mechanisms. In the previous studies we looked at, we just focused on a single resource, but of course species require multiple resources. For example, plants need light, water, nitrogen, phosphorus, etc. Animals also need water, food, shelter, etc. And species differ in their competitive abilities for these resources. For example, we learned how plants differ in their photosynthetic pathways um, that allow them to be better competitors under certain environmental conditions than others. <laughs> and in the animal world, for example, um, take birds of prey, for example. They, they certainly differ in their competitive abilities to find, prey, find and capture prey, to feed themselves and their young. So, Systems, ecological systems um, have many different resources and species are competing for multiple resources simultaneously. A study conducted by David Tillman demonstrated this phenomenon um, where he looked at um, different species of diatoms again. And, excuse me, just had to take a little break there. Um, in, in this study by David Tillman, he looked again at, at diatoms, but this time he was interested to see whether um, coexistence had 
um, something to do with species competing for multiple resources. So this, this graph um, shows, this graph on the lower right, um, shows uh, two different, the two different species of diatoms that we, uh, well, not the two same ones. Uh, one of them is the same, the Asterionella and Cyclotella. So these two uh, species were, were grown under conditions of both looking at uh, silicate and also phosphorus as the two different resources that um, they that were required by them. Of course, there are others, but um, this study by Tillman just looked at silicate and, and phosphate. And so the these two species are, are shown here in which um, uh, in both cases, their growth um, is, is shown over a period of time. Uh, Asterionella on the top and Cyclotella on the bottom. And um, the concentration of phosphate is declining, you can see over time as well, as that population um, continues to grow. When these species are phosphate limited, what you can see is that Asterionella uh, outcompetes the Cyclotella when um, phosphate is limited. So Asterionella is a better competitor for phosphorus when um, phosphorus is limited. However, when Tillman grew uh, Cyclotella and Asterionella with limiting um, silica, he found that Cyclotella was actually a better competitor when the silicate mineral was limiting. And that's, that's shown in these four panels where you can see the CM is for uh, Cyclotella. However, um, when they were grown with um, intermediate levels or intermediate concentrations of each of these nutrients, they actually um, coexisted. So, uh, sorry for the panel there that's coming up in front, but I think you can see from those different panels that when both species were grown together um, and the nutrients that, that were, they were grown in were at intermediate levels, they actually both coexisted. And this suggested that the coexistence could occur if the species were limited by different resources. So Asterionella was um, outcompeted the Cyclotella uh, when it was phosphorus limited. Okay, so the Cyclotella was limited by um, phosphorus uh, under that case, and the Asterionella outcompeted it. But when silica was limited, Cyclotella outcompeted the Asterionella. So these two different nutrients, um, when they're grown together, when those species were limited by a different resource, they, they um, actually persisted in the system. So this suggests that when species are competing for multiple resources and the species are limited by different ones, that uh, coexistence can um, result. Of course, species don't compete in a vacuum for resources. They also live in natural systems where plenty of other factors um, in the environment can influence them as well. In his studies of barnacles, Joseph Connell demonstrated how the balance of competition between different species can actually be altered by certain abiotic conditions in the environment. So al along the coast, of course, there are these intertidal systems, and Connell, um, Joe Connell, uh, did a lot of work in, in these systems, and he observed that uh, larvae of two different barnacle species are distributed very broadly along um, the, both the upper and lower intertidal zones in these intertidal systems. But even though the larvae were evenly distributed across these intertidal zones, the upper and the lower intertidal, suggesting that the barnacles had 
the same potential to colonize each of them, what he found was that the adults were actually distributed very differently in th into different zones. The stellate barnacle, uh, the thamelis barnacle, uh, was found to occupy the upper intertidal zone because it's more resistant to desiccation. Um, those upper intertidals get drier for longer, um, and it's more resistant to that desiccation. And they're uh, limited to those higher intertidal areas because they can't compete successfully against the rock barnacle that occupies the lower intertidal zone. In contrast, the rock barnacle tends to be found in the lower intertidal zone in greater abundance because it's a superior competitor in this zone against the stellate barnacle. But in the upper intertidal zone, it's not a very effective competitor with the stellate barnacle because it's not very resistant to desiccation. So this suggests that the balance of competition between species can be um, sort of modified or altered by the abiotic, by abiotic conditions in the environment. Another factor that uh, is really quite important is um, in, in terms of affecting the balance of competition among um, individuals of different species is disturbance. Now we haven't really talked about ecological disturbance uh, yet, but um, fundamentally a, a disturbance is a phenomenon that dramatically reduces the biomass of, of species across the board and fundamentally changes the functioning of a system. Eventually the, the, the species, in other words the community of species, will um, return through a process called succession that we'll talk about. But these disturbances, and a, a good example is fire, um, as is shown here in two different um, systems. Fire, as with other kinds of disturbances like, you know, hurricanes or floods or things like that, removes many of the species. Um, and, and so that opens up habitat for other species, other individuals, um, to colonize those open areas that otherwise um, they might have been outcompeted in. An example in, in systems like the Ponderosa pine forests here in California and the New Jersey pine barrens that receive, that experience lots of fires, is that fire removes many woody species and favors the growth of uh, trees and grasses and herbs that are more fire adapted. So by reducing the number of different species, a disturbance can reduce competition and allow less competitive species to actually get a foothold and persist in a, um, you know, in a, in a ecological system that they otherwise could not. In the New Jersey Pine Barrens, for example, when fires are very, very frequent, and in some areas um, they are, uh, oak species are excluded from the community entirely, that you just don't find them. But when fire frequencies are reduced, in other words, they occur less frequently, oak has um, a chance to, to um, occupy the community. Fires can reduce competition from the oak for other species and allow them to establish. So when fires are more frequent, um, it excludes the more competitive oak species and allows other less competitive species to, to um, persist. So this is a, an example. Disturbance is a mechanism by which competitive interactions can be altered and coexistence can occur. And we'll talk more about um, disturbance and succession in a few lectures. Another phenomenon or another mechanism, I should say, um, that can influence the balance of competition is, is predation. And we've talked about uh, predator-prey interactions, but I want to focus a little bit on um, how, how predation can alter 
sort of the balance of, of competition. I'm going to talk about a study, um, a set of studies anyway, that was done by um, Bob Payne in the 60s, and he's kind of continued, uh, he had continued this work over quite a few decades. Um, looking at intertidal communities, I guess we like, I guess I like to give intertidal ex community examples. Um, but he did a lot of work um, up in Washington, in particular on uh, the study that I'm going to uh, talk to you about f for this example was conducted on a small island off the coast of Washington called Tatouche Island. And what Bob Payne did was he was studying the intertidal community and particularly focused on two species, the Pisaster, which is a, um, a highly predatory species that consumes a lot of different um, uh, other species in these intertidal systems, including the mussel mytilus. So in these intertidal systems, there's a, a relatively simple uh, food web. In other words, a, a, a web of feeding interactions among the different species. Pisaster is sort of at the top of the food chain, if you will, or the food web. It um, is a consumer of pretty much every species that exists in these intertidal zones, including the, the uh, mussel mytilus, but also barnacles, limpets, and, and so forth. So that's indicated here in this diagram of the, the arrows all sort of pointing upwards towards Pisaster. All the energy from those different species is going into the Pisaster because it's the top predator. So the system, the, the community of different species here uh, is, is relatively simple, but um, really fundamentally controlled by this predator, Pisaster. And so Bob Payne um, conducted a series of, of manipulations, but one in particular where he had areas of Tatouche Island in this intertidal where he removed Pisaster and other areas where he left Pisaster as part of the food web. And what he did was he quantified the numbers of different species and their abundances in these intertidal zones under these two different conditions. So in some cases, like I said, he removed Pisaster. Um, in other cases, he didn't. What he found um, across the years that he was studying this system where he he removed and didn't remove Pisaster, was that um, Pisaster was a, a pretty voracious predator, first of all, but in particular, it would um, it favored Mytilus. Mytilus, when left unchecked by Pisaster, would would grow um, and take over large areas of the intertidal, so that when Pisaster was removed, in other words the level of predation on the mytilus was reduced and mytilus grew out of control and essentially would outcompete the other species in this intertidal community. So in areas where Pisaster was removed, it fundamentally changed the community food web, allowing mytilus to increase in population it being an effective pre, uh, competitor of other species like the barnacles and limpets and so forth, the diversity of these communities dramatically declined. And so as a result, Pisaster, uh, just as a single species uh, of predator, was tremendously important in influencing the entire community food web of these intertidal zones. So. Bob Payne coined this term, keystone predator, um, because the Pisaster, in this case, the predator, um, really was occupying a keystone role. In other words, it, it alone was tremendously important in dictating the diversity and abundance of species in this intertidal community food web. So when it was present, the diversity and abundance of the different species was much higher and coexistence occurred. When it was absent, uh, it really disrupted the structure of the food web, reduced the diversity, 
and um, ultimately uh, reduced coexistence of species. So the presence of this predator was really important in um, governing the, val the balance of competition between Mytilus and these other species. So essentially modulating that balance. So this is termed a, um, so Pisaster is considered a keystone predator. That, that term keystone, by the way, is also used for other kinds of species um, that play a particularly disproportionate role in influencing the structure of an ecological community. It doesn't have to be a predator. Um, when it is a predator, we refer to those species as keystone predators, but a keystone species could be any species that has a its presence has a disproportionate effect on the structure of an ecological community. As you recall from our discussion of the niche, a species niche is shaped by interactions with other species. And of course, I'm referring here to their realized niche. When species op uh, overlap in their resource use, their niches overlap. For example, species A and B shown here, that is the blue species and the green species, um, they their niche space overlaps in their use of seeds as a primary food source across the available range of seed sizes on the x-axis. High niche overlap such as this means that the species are effectively competing for the same types of seeds. The higher the niche overlap, the greater the degree the two species will compete with one another for a particular resource. When the niches of species are highly overlapping, Competition, competition between the species can be uh, very intense, so much so that in the zone of high niche overlap, growth, survival, and reproduction, that is, of course, fitness is what I'm referring to, um, of these individuals will be negatively affected. As a consequence, high niche overlap between species can result in directional selection for traits that result in reduced niche overlap between the species over evolutionary time. This is illustrated in this niche diagram in which the two species have high overlap in seed size and due to directional selection in each of the two species as a consequence of this intense competition, directional selection for reduced niche overlap results in a gradual divergence of traits. Of course, um, and, and so this is indicated um, in terms of reduced niche overlap. So this divergence and thus separation of niches can really only happen though as long as there's enough of a range in the sizes of seeds available. So since we're dealing with seed size on the x-axis here, um, the niches can really only diverge as shown if there are both larger and smaller seed sizes available for um, the species uh, to adapt to. We call this range um, of resources the uh, resource base. If, however, the total resource um, base is much smaller, as is shown here in this shorter uh, resource base, arrow that is, um, the range of resources is much more limited and as a consequence niche breadth or width, another way of saying that, may become also become smaller such that the species niches are packed more tightly into the available resource space. So if the resource base is much smaller, as is shown by this um, arrow that um, covers a more limited range of seed sizes, the niches actually um, can be compressed uh, such that um, if, this, if two species are occupying this niche um, space, in order to coexist, they would, their, their um, breadths, the widths of the niches would have to be narrower. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as niche packing. So um, 
this can happen if multiple species are in competition for the same total resource base. This example here shows three different species. Um, of course, ecological communities can have more than three species in them that are competing for the same kinds of resources. So the way to think about this is that the niche space is, is a finite space as indicated by the range across the x-axis. The more species there are for a given finite base of resources, the more tightly they, they're going to have to be packed into that space, um, and thus the narrower their niches. In communities with multiple similar species competing with the same resources, niche breadth will tend to be, um, become small, uh, narrower, that is, over time. So the species in the community uh, will be dividing up those limited resources ever more finely. As a result, their realized niches are narrower and packed more tightly. This phenomenon is called niche partitioning or resource partitioning. Let's take, let's take a look at an example. In a study of five species of American warblers, all of which are insectivorous bird species that coexist in, um, in spruce trees. Robert MacArthur, uh, an eminent ecologist at the time, was interested in how such similar um, species with similar food and nesting requirements could coexist with one another. Based on detailed observations um, of these birds and their behaviors, he found that the birds each consistently fed on insects in different parts of the tree. They nested at different times and they used different feeding behaviors to obtain insects. They compete for the same food resources, but um, given these differences that he found um, among the birds in terms of their foraging in different parts of the trees and nesting at different times, um, that he came to the conclusion that they occupy slightly different niches. For example, the Cape May war warbler, um, which is shown in the top left of the diagram, feeds more consistently near the tops of the trees uh, than any of the other warblers, and it restricts its foraging to the outer shell of the tree as well. The bay-breasted war warbler, on the other hand, um, confines its foraging primarily to the middle portion of the tree, spending most of its time in the tree's interior. And MacArthur also observed very similar and consistent patterns of foraging and nesting among um, the other species. By foraging it um, in different feeding zones and using different feeding behaviors, uh, as well as nesting in different parts of the trees and at different times, the bird species um, occupy slightly different niches and thereby reduce niche overlap. Consequently, individuals minimize competition and as a consequence of that, maximize reproductive success. So MacArthur concluded that by pursuing slightly different resources or obtaining these resources in slightly different ways, the bird species are able to coexist within the community despite requiring what on first appearance would was the same type of food resources and nesting habitat among these five different species of warblers. Overall, this can result in decreased composition among species within a community and consequently um, give rise to coexistence. When the divergence of traits is accentuated in competing species that overlap, but those differences are minimized or lost where the species distributions don't overlap, this is a phenomenon called character displacement. In 1986, Grant um, and others studied the evolution of traits in several of Darwin's finches in response to competition. He found that two species of finches that live on two different islands in the Galapagos, the large ground finch and the medium ground finch, um, they have similar beaks that are both suited for essentially using the same type of food supply. On a third island, the two finch species coexist, but 
due to natural selection, the beak of each bird species is morphologically different and enables them to feed on seeds of a different size. So what he observed was that on different islands, as shown in these two graphs, these are um, a graph of the frequency distribution of beads, uh, beak sizes, excuse me, of the two different um, finch species, the large ground finch on the top and me medium ground finch on the bottom. These graphs show this frequency distribution of the bird populations when they are on the two different islands. We call those allopatric populations, in other words, populations that are um, distinct geographically in terms of their distribution. So I think what you can clearly see from these results is that when the bird populations are on different islands, the frequency distributions of their beak sizes actually overlaps quite a bit on the lower end for the large ground finch on a, and on the upper end of the frequency distribution for the medium ground finch. However, when the populations are sympatric, that is that when the populations, when uh, on islands where the populations coexist and therefore interact with one another, there's little or no overlap in beak size distributions between the two populations. Based on these results, Grant concluded that when the distribution of similar competing species overlap, competition between them is more intense than where the, when their distributions don't overlap. That is, greater overlap of these finch species accentuated differences among traits in the similar species when their distributions overlap geographically, but the differences were minimized or lost where the species distributions didn't overlap. Several species of Galapagos finches have also, other species that is, have also been observed to display this phenomenon of character displacement. Each of these species um, is closely related, yet when they co-occur, they differ in beak size and beak, beak depth and some other characteristics of, of beak um, size and shape. These trait differences allow them to coexist in the same reason, uh, region because due to differences in beak size and shape, each species actually eats a different type of seed that corresponds to the morphology of its particular and unique beak. For instance, finches with deeper, stronger beaks consume large, uh, larger and tougher seeds, whereas finches with smaller beaks consume the smaller and softer seeds. Ecological interactions such as this can exert very strong selection pressure, such strong selection pressure that the trait that's being used to acquire the resource, in this case the beak size of, of the finch to eat seeds, um, that that trait can adapt over generations to a distinctly new character state that better matches it to the available uh, seed food supply. So competition plays a very important role in shaping species niches and the structure of populations and communities over evolutionary time. Now we're going to turn our attention uh, to the fundamental types of competition. Competition can occur in three different ways. There's a direct, uh, direct exploitation of resources, and this is called exploitation competition. Interference competition is a type of competition that occurs when competitors don't directly consume resources, but they actually defend them. And apparent competition is a phenomenon that appears, it, it appears to be um, the result of com competition, but actually it's due to some other mechanism. Thus far, the examples I've given have been those of exploitation competition. That is, the direct consumption of resources by individuals of a species such that the availability of those resources is reduced for other individuals. So examples, of course, would be, you know, plants competing for limited water, 
um, animals competing for seed resources or so forth. So, um, and we've talked about some of those things. So I won't provide any more examples of those, but I would like to focus on um, interference competition and apparent competition. Interference competition differs from exploitation competition in that the competitors, as I mentioned, defend the resources rather than directly consume them. An example is, say, animals defending their own territory, defending them against others um, who might come in uh, to be taking food resources that they might have, or males fighting over mates with whom they are seeking to reproduce. Another very interesting example um, is shown here, and it's called allelopathy. Allelopathy is a type of interference competition that occurs when organisms use chemicals to harm their competitors. So it's, it's a mode of, of defense, if you will, um, that, uh, but it's due to the use of sort of chemical warfare, you might say. Um, two examples are, are shown here. One um, on the left, uh, black walnut trees actually release, uh, produce and release an aromatic compound called juglone. This, this compound actually inhibit, inhibits the enzymes of other plants. And um, it's released by uh, many different parts of the plants, but in particular uh, by uh, the roots. You can find it in leaves, bark, and, and so forth, but it leaches from the roots into their surrounding soil and it actually inhibits the growth, germination even also, and growth of other plants surrounding it. So it's actually, in a sense, defending its territory, but it's using a chemical means to do so. The common reed, also Phragmites australis, is another example of a plant species that produces um, uh, chemical compounds that inhibit the growth of other other plant species. So let's take a look at, at that. In a study by Rudrapa et al. in 2007, um, they studied allelopathy by isolating um, certain chemicals called exudates from the root. Now ex an exudate is just simply a chemical compound that is released from, from the root. Um, and they isolated root exudates from uh, both a native race and an exotic race of the uh, of the common reed, Phragmites. And they they after they extracted it and isolated it, they exposed um, several different plant species to it to see what response they had. So they applied these exudates to three different species, and those are shown here, um, both in the, the picture panels and also in this graph. Arabidopsis on the left, Arabidopsis thaliana, that is, Nicotiniana tabacum, that's the tobacco plant, Brassica rapa, um, th those are Brassica and the Arabidopsis are both um, in the mustard family. So when they um, applied root extracts to these plants, uh, they made a number of different observations. First of all, um, the root extracts cause the plant species to grow poorly compared to controls. Um, and you can see that in this graph, uh, which is uh, uh, for the three different species, they, they measured, measured total fresh weight of the plants. Under control conditions where there was no added exudate, you can see that the left bars for each species are um, show that the, the plants um, grew a lot more than those that were um, exposed to the root exudates from the Phragmites. For the Arabidopsis thaliana, you can see that both the native reed exudate, uh, the B called, uh, referred to as BB here, and the P38 exotic reed um, exudates caused um, a dramatic and significant reduction in the growth of the Arabidopsis. There were also corresponding decreases in the other species um, when those exudates were applied. Um, but interestingly, uh, the, in the case of Nicotiniana, the tobacco plant, the root exudates 
from the invasive um, race of Phragmites actually inhibited the growth um, more than the, the native strain. In fact, the, the native strain didn't seem to have um, a, a significant uh, reduction in, in growth. For the brassica as well, the invasive uh, strain exudate seemed to cause a significant decline in growth, but not nearly as much for the native, um, the native strain. Although, an, and then um, in the picture panels, they also noted that uh, the treatment of plants with these root exudates also resulted in a pretty ac acute um, toxicity to the roots of the plants as well. <coughs> Although um, the, uh, there was an active ingredient in the Phragmites that was identified, it was identified as gallic acid. It's, um, it's become unclear as to whether this particular chemical compound was the chemical responsible or whether it was some other chemical that caused the inhibition. But nonetheless, um, these, uh, and, and that's not clearly known because these root exudates are actually kind of complex chemical mixtures um, of exudates that are produced by the roots. Nonetheless, uh, it still is clear that um, there is some influence, an uh, inhibitory influence on other species um, by Phragmites, suggesting that it is um, engaging in allelopathy, this form of interference competition. Lastly, um, let's talk about apparent competition. Apparent competition actually isn't competition at all. It just looks like competition, um, but the mechanism is different. So let's take a look at an example, I think, that will help um, explain. In Southern California, ecologists observed a regular pattern of bare ground around the perimeter of a, of a, of a native shrub called purple sage, and that's shown in the, the image here. The, it's the, sh the um, shrub on the left. And, um, but around the shrub, there was this sort of bare zone. Initially, ecologists hypothesized that this bare soil around the sage was caused by the release of phytotoxic chemicals, in other words, allele chemicals, that were produced by the shrubs that were thought to inhibit the growth of neighboring plants. At the time, um, this made some sense because uh, other shrub species were known to produce allelopathic allele, allele chemicals, excuse me, which could inhibit the growth of other plants when the chemicals were at um, high enough concentrations in the soil. However, not all of the shrub species with bare soil around them produce these chemicals. So the, this allele, allelopathy hypothesis wasn't really universally supported and even suggested that there might be a different possible mechanism than allelopathy altogether. This prompted researchers, including um, Bartholomew, whose uh, results I'm going to show you, uh, and others to test an alternative hypothesis, and that is that this pattern was instead due to herbivores consuming establishing seedlings in this bare zone. To test this, the researchers placed seeds in both um, bare zone and in both the bare zone and surrounding areas and monitored how many seeds were consumed by the herbivores in each of these locations. What they found was that 86% of the seeds were actually consumed in the bare zones versus only 12% in the grass. They also did some trapping where they put out traps um, and when they did, they captured 23 mice in the bear zone, but only one in the grass area. So this started to suggest that herbivores might be responsible. To be sure, they conducted um, what's called an exclusion experiment. So Bartholomew went a step further uh, and constructed cages uh, to exclude or not exclude rodents and um, placed these cages in the bear zone. From this graph, I think you can see that in the open cages, he found um, 
more growth of, of plants in the closed compared to the open cages. So uh, what's measured here is dry mass of the plants in the, in the bare zone um, in both the open and closed cages. So the fact that, um, he, and in fact, he found 20 times more growth of plants in the closed compared to the open cages. And this, so this strongly suggested that herbivory and not allelopathy was responsible um, for the formation of these bear zones. So again, um, although this appeared to be competition, it was actually due to another mechanism, in this case, herbivory. So we call that apparent competition. 